The Steiner T5XI 5 to 25 by 56 was a rifle scope that I reviewed almost three years ago to the month. Next month will be three years. And it was shortly after I reviewed that that I ended up trading that in for this, the 3 to 15 by 50, its smaller brother. I had very high hopes for the T5 series, but the 5 to 25 fell very short optically. Hopefully, this 3 to 15 will perform even better. I know the T6 series have superseded the T5s, but you can still find these fairly reasonably priced for around $1,000 used. So, if you're in the market for one of these, would it at least be a good purchase? So, to answer that question, let's get behind it and see if it would be. The box is typical Steiner. It uses nice, heavy, dense cardboard on the outside with this really nice laminate, so it gives it a nice, shiny finish. And on the inside, you will see that it comes in the standard foam that most other Steiner products come in, which is really nicely cut out and laid out, so this way, nothing shifts anywhere. The boxes really are excellent. As you can see, we've got a sunshade, Tenebrex caps, and a throw lever included with this scope. One thing I really like about this 3 to 15 is the 25 meter minimum side parallax. All the other Steiners that we've looked at have a minimum of 50 meters, and it does suck. The weight on this is actually pretty felt at 30 ounces, despite the fact it's got a 34 millimeter tube and a 50 millimeter front objective. It's not terrible, all things considered. The 5 to 25 PST Gen 2 does come in a little bit lighter, by about 1.2 ounces, but this only has a 30 millimeter tube as opposed to a 34, and that's where a lot of the weight does come in from. Back when I still had it, the Gen 2 Razor HD 3 to 18 comes in more than 50% heavier. So it really does make the T5 feel like a lightweight by comparison. I went more in depth with the overall physicality of the 5 to 25 in that video. So if you want to find out more, go check that out. There are a couple of things that still bother me with this, but they still bother me with the T6 series. And that is things like the illumination control. The cover for the battery compartment is also the way that you change the illumination so if you don't have it on there tight and you wiggle it back and forth a little bit you can loosen it up but it has a really nice locking fast focus eyepiece and decent turrets albeit non-locking but they do offer a pretty solid zero stop and a pretty neat windowed system for your rotational indicator which we're going to take a look at shortly after we check out the scr reticle the SCR reticle you can find on a variety of different Steiner and Burris products. Here in 3 to 15 form, you can see we're probably getting close to the point where it's going to be too fine at the lowest magnification to really use it super effectively. But those posts at 3, 6, and 9 really do help draw your eye more towards the center. The reticle is a little bit simple. It's a standard milling reticle. It can be found in both MOA and mills as seen here, and it is illuminated. Some people will love it, some people will hate it, but I find it to be fairly adequate. Slowly increasing the magnification to its maximum of 15x, you'll see that we have no sort of shadowing or change and shift to the image as we increase it to maximum, and the reticle fills out quite nicely. There's a nice center crosshair to help you line up with more precise shots, and you can see that off to the side and on top, you do have this very, very fine area where you could use it for measuring. It's a little bit hard to really pick up, but if you're patient with it, you can use it fairly well. The illumination on this thing is adequate. During bright daylight hours, you will not notice it unless you're really in like a dark shadowy canopy of tree coverage. Then you could just slightly sort of pick it up, which is more or less where you're going to need it the most anyway. At nighttime, it's going to get more than bright enough, but you can clearly see where the emitter is down at six o'clock because it's darker down there than it is up top. The illumination rotary dial does not spin 360 degrees, so you have a hard stop on the minimum and the maximum, which again is going to be personal preference, but I kind of like it. I just wish that I didn't have to worry about unscrewing the battery compartment every time I used it. The turrets do exude a good bit of mush, I'll say, in between detents, but once you start turning it, it does have a very positive sound and a decent feel. These turrets do require a bit more effort to turn than most. I think it has to do with the windowed system inside. The zero stop does work well, but they are non-locking, unfortunately, but that has been rectified again in the T6 series. 
Now onto the tracking test, you can see that the SCR reticle lines up to the target basically perfectly. Adjusting the side parallax will show that there is a slight shift of the reticle on the target, but nowhere near out of the realm of what I would say is consistent with most other products. The biggest thing when it comes to precision tracking is repeatability and the general ability to track. But first, the illumination down here is just barely noticeable. This does not use a standard CR2032. It uses a 2450, I believe, which is a much larger cell battery, but it does not increase the brightness of the illumination. It's just a larger cell for longer runtime. I have a sneaky suspicion that they're still using older technology that requires a larger battery to keep the brightness going for longer. Anyway, mini box test four over four up seems to be pretty close. We're probably about a tenth of a mil off on the rest of the reticle to the right. But other than that, it looked really solid. Returning to zero on the windage also again seems fairly solid, but it does look like the reticle might be canted slightly above the center point. From there, we're going to continue up the rest of the 10 mils. And as you will soon find out, the thing tracks all the way up to 10 mils extremely well. The reticle does seem to favor the right hand side of our main line, but by less than a tenth of a mil. As far as our overall elevation gain or loss, it's perfect at 10 mils, or at least it is on my scale. And returning it back to zero, you can see everything lines up really, really well. From the subterranean caverns of the basement out into the real world, you can see our view of our 30-yard power tower is not impeded by any trees outside my window. That is because I filmed this segment about two and a half years ago. I had the scope for quite some time. Uh, I got it just after I did the review of the 5-25, to which again is almost three years ago. And when that video dropped, I'd probably already had this thing swapped out, and I had it for quite some time. I... I did test with it quite rigorously, rigorously, geez, my tongue is too big for my mouth sometimes. Anywho, focusing on our image quality here at 30 yards, because we have that 25 meter minimum side parallax, we can dial into this just so, and we are left with a fairly good looking image. Now Steiners typically have a little bit more chromatic aberration of the purple variety that I've noticed over some other brands, but here on the high contrast power lines in front of both the transformer itself and the cloud-ish covered skyline, we don't really notice much of it. Focusing our attention at the top of the power pole, you'll see again that there isn't that much chromatic aberration to speak of, but you will note a little bit at nine o'clock on that more vertical power line is a little bit of purple, and on the horizontal lines in the background there's a little bit of green, but that's basically as bad as it got for me throughout this entire review. Let's back out the magnification back to 3x and focus our attentions at a slightly farther target. This 400 yard brick building is exactly 400 yards. So I set the side parallax roughly to that 350 ish meter mark where it should be. But before we zoom in, let's admire the large field of view here. At 3x, we have 36 feet of field of view and a very small border around the actual view looking through it of the scope body. I feel it's a really nice balance and it was a joy to get behind and use. The reticle, again, I do maintain gets a little bit too fine in the center, but it's better than some of the more Christmas tree style reticles of the MPVO variety. Slowly increasing the magnification here, I stop at 10 for just a moment and crack it all the way up to 15. The image does look fairly good, but I do try to adjust the side parallax ever so slightly to see if I can get a little bit more out of it. Happily, I do find that I can get a little bit better sharpness out of it. And frankly, we are left with not only a very good looking sharp image, but also it has a lot of depth of feel to it. The trees on the left at nine o'clock are about 250 yards and the trees in the background are about 700 ish yards. So all of that is in focus, despite the fact we're at the maximum magnification with a side parallax that's roughly around the four to 500 meter mark. Is it really that terrible that the side parallax doesn't meet up with the actual distances that we're looking at? No, it doesn't really matter all that much. It's just a gauge to get you roughly in the ballpark. A lot of manufacturers don't even put numbers on there because they don't want people to constantly call them up and say, hey, my, my parallax isn't lining up properly. Can you fix it? And then they have to explain it. It's not really going to be that precise. Some scopes do it better than others, but Steiner, even on some of their models, don't even have numbers on there. They just have a little bit of wedge so you have an idea of what's closer and what's farther away. Backing out the magnification a little bit, just to focus on our 900 yard power tower. Again, at this magnification, we're around eight to 10 X. It's got a very good looking field of view. In fact, at its maximum magnification, we have 7.3 feet at 15 X, which is a little bit better than average in my findings. 
pulling back the side parallax to showcase those 30 yard power lines before we go all the way out to 900 and the image does look very good if i had to nitpick the image for one characteristic i'd say the contrast is a little lacking the image is sharp and clear and fairly bright, but some of those darks don't seem as dark and some of those brights don't seem as bright. They all seem a little bit more muted. Again, though, we do have some heavy cloud cover this day, so there is going to be a little bit of muting to the image. But all the time that I used this, almost a year and a half before I finished it and ended up selling it, I just found that the image seemed a little bit more muted. However, at 15x at 900 yards, it is capable of producing a very sharp looking image with minimal chromatic aberration. That is also further reinforced by our 1000 yard performance. Here you can see those little dividers on that window quite easily. A lot of people get caught up thinking that they need more magnification to shoot better at distance. I don't think that is the case. I think you need a higher quality lens with more resolution and more clarity as opposed to just more magnification. It's like having three McDonald's cheeseburgers versus one super fancy, nice, high quality cheeseburger. Yeah, they might technically contain the same meat and some of the same ingredients, but what are the quality of, of those ingredients? That's what I really care for. One might make might make you feel really sick afterwards the other one not so much adding 10 mils of elevation and there's almost no difference to my eye as far as the quality of the image and there's no exit pupil shift as well it is a tremendously nice performance i do think a lot of this has to do with the 34 millimeter tube a lot of 30 millimeter tubes i find at higher magnifications at greater distances you start to see a little bit more of an exit pupil shift but not here into iBox and image stability. Here at 3x, you can see at 30 yards, as we shift our eye around, you can see the parallax of things moving at different speeds and planes of existence. But ultimately, we have fairly good sharpness to the image and the reticle when we go off center. That is a good performance. At 10x, the parallax is much more noticeable, but the sharpness to the reticle and the image still remains fairly high up until you literally can't look through the scope anymore. So again, it's a pretty good performance. The exit pupil on this is fairly large, so it makes getting behind this thing at these magnifications even easier. At 15x, the exit pupil is going to shrink down, but that's normal across every magnified optic. But here, I don't care about that as much as I care about just the ability for the reticle and the image to stay sharp to one another. And here, they do a fairly good job of that as well. So, image stability-wise, this thing is pretty solid. Taking a more dynamic approach at this, at 3x you can see you can get really far away from it or choke up pretty tightly against it and still manage to look through it fairly easily. The reticle is just noticeable against the gray berm, which is just recycled tires, and it's just what I would consider usable. At about 10x here, again the eye box is going to get tighter, but it is definitely not too tight to actually use it, especially in a dynamic roll. At 15x it is going to get much tighter, but you can still help guide yourself into the center if you are slightly off of it. Another reason why I like MPVOs is because you have a little bit more luxury and leeway when you get behind it in a dynamic roll like this. Let's look at the low light performance before we get into the side by side comparisons. And here, the illumination is going to be the weakest link. This is on at full, the battery was fresh, so this is as good as you could really expect. As far as the overall brightness of the image coming through the scope, as we slowly increase to its maximum magnification, you'll see that the image really doesn't lose that much brightness to it. However, getting behind any optic at its maximum magnification where the exit pupil is going to be much smaller as the ambient light gets darker or lower rather your eye pupil is going to get larger and thus you're going to have this weird shadow effect so it's going to be a lot harder to get behind a lot of these scopes unless they have a really really large exit pupil here i found it to be fairly adequate and it does get noticeably better below 10x again just because the exit pupil sizes still a pretty solid performance Let's get into the comparisons, and the first one's going to be with my scope of the year for 2023, the Athlon Helios BTR Gen 2 2 to 12. This thing comes in in the mid to low 400s. You could even find them on sale for even less. 
Uh, so it makes them half the price of the T5XI. They are only a 2 to 12 as opposed to a 3 to 15, but for many people's uses, I don't think that'll be that much of an issue. They are made in China as opposed to the USA. That's something I did not mention earlier. The T5s are made in the US. They do use uh, Scotch glass though, but I don't know exactly what level or quality of their glass. Regardless, here, at least in the 315 version, this one at least, uh, proved to be quite good. The 5 to 25 was the exact opposite. However, the reticle on the T5, the SCR is pretty good, but the AMHR2 on the Helos is better. It's just a nicer little reticle for me. For you, it might be a completely, you know, the exact opposite. But personal preference is a thing that we really should take into consideration more frequently. As far as the overall length on these two, the Steiner is going to be almost an inch and a half longer. It's going to be about five ounces heavier, and the field of view isn't going to be as good, but that's because the Helos has a lower magnification. At 400 yards here, you're, there's a 3x difference between these two at the maximum. 3x. That's a lot, but it doesn't seem like a lot. Granted, you know, we're only at 400 yards, but the image doesn't seem like it's that much of a noticeable difference. As far as the eye relief on both of them, they're about the same, all things considered. The Athlon's about 3.6 inches, where if you were to average out the Steiner, it would be about 3.7 inches, give or take a little bit. What else can I say about these two other than they might fill the role for you perfectly? I do prefer the Athlon for a number of varying reasons, namely really excellent locking turrets, whereas the Steiner doesn't. But this is going to be more of just a generalized, yeah, you can get this opposed to that for much less money. Talking about something that's about the same money but still less expensive is the Miopta Optica 63 to 18 by 50. This is a scope that I've recommended more often than I uh, can truly remember. As far as the overall length, the Miopta will be about an inch and a half longer. They weigh about exactly the same. As far as our field of view, they're really close, but you got to give it to the Steiner at 3x. It's going to be about three feet larger and at its maximum of 15x. It's going to be larger only because the optic goes to 18x. As far as reticle choices, I'm going to have to go with the MRED 1 found with the Optica 6 hands down. It's just a, again, a more practical and usable reticle at all magnifications, especially here at 3x. And the illumination works better with the MRED 1 being that centered little crosshair, which I personally prefer. One area where the Steiner is absolutely going to beat the Miopta is going to be with the exit pupil. At the minimum of 3x, the Steiner is at about 12 millimeter, as opposed to the Miopta, which is about 9.5 millimeter. That is huge. If you have a really strong, solid cheek weld, it's not as noticeable. But if you're shooting dynamically, that is going to be the difference of being able to look through your scope and not. And the trend continues when we increase the magnification. Going up to the maximum on the Miopta of 18x, you get 2.8 millimeter, as opposed to 15x on the Steiner, which is 3.4 millimeter. Again, a fairly large difference. As far as the optical quality on both of them, I think they're both really good. I will give the edge ever so slightly to the Miopta. I will also give the less chromatic aberration to the Miopta. I will also give, well, almost everything else to the Miopta. The lock and turret setup and the capped windage on the Optica 6 is fantastic. And generally, all of the controls are absolutely stellar. There's nothing to really complain about, with the exception of it not having a rev indicator. But how often are you really going to go over 10 mils of added elevation anyway? And if you do, you're going to remember it, hopefully. Now, usually I make comparisons with scopes that I actually highly recommend, but now I'm going to do it with one that I don't recommend as much, and that's the Loophole Mark V 3.6 to 18 by 44. I do think that this scope is limited in a couple of key areas, and maybe I'm just trying to showcase that the T5XI, despite the fact that it's about the same age as the Mark V, performs better in most cases as opposed to the Mark V. So here's actually a scope that's considerably more expensive than the T5 and doesn't perform as good, especially in my opinion, and my opinions couldn't be the driving force behind this. As far as things that we can all be grounded on, the T5 is about $1,000 less expensive than the Mark V. They're both made in the US. The Mark V also has a 35 millimeter tube as opposed to a 34 millimeter tube, so you might have to get special mounts for it. Here at the exact same distances on very similar days, the contrast is a little bit better than the Mark V, but that's a about the only thing that I would say it has over the T5. 
that and the weight. It's about four ounces lighter, and it's about an inch shorter. But that's about it. As far as the exit pupil, it's going to go to the Mark V, believe it or not. They're about the same, but there is still that 0.6x at the low end and the 3x at the top end but yet they're exactly the same size. The biggest key difference is when you get behind both of these, these are at the exact same crop. The T5 is much larger to look through as opposed to the Mark V, which for many people is going to be good enough reason to go with one versus the other. Do I recommend either of these? Mm, that's only for you to decide. My final comparison is going to be one that I haven't showcased in quite some time, but I did bring it up in the unboxing segment earlier. It is, of course, the Vortex Razor HD Gen 2, which Vortex currently says is discontinued. So if you're in the market for getting one of these, pick one of these up before they become used property forever. It is in my humble opinion that the Vortex Razor HD Gen 2 3D18x50 is perhaps the best overall 3D18 on the market with the exception of it being 47 ounces. It's got a giant view looking through it. All the controls are top notch. They still are a little bit expensive and a little bit larger, but just look at the images here between these two. The T5 isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, but the Razer HD just is better. Reticles are completely personal, so you'll have to figure out which one you prefer. As far as the field of view looking through them, the Razer is going to be larger by about two feet at its minimum and uh, a little bit smaller at the maximum. But again, there's that 3x difference. The biggest thing, though, is going to be the exit pupil where the Razer is 16.7 millimeter at its minimum as opposed to 12 millimeter. I don't know if that's the correct number. That's the only thing I could really find, but it's huge, like properly, properly huge. These two don't really fit the same role sheerly because of the weight discrepancy. 17 ounces is literally the weight of some pistols, so you got to figure out what's going to be best for you. If it's a bench gun and you're looking for the best, but you're looking for an MPVO, the Razor's got my vote between these two. So why did it take basically two years to get this review out to you guys? Well, my Steiner videos usually don't do all that well, and I had a lot of scopes come into the channel that I wanted to get out sooner. Plus, it was around the same time that my wife was pregnant, and uh, I had more important things to focus my attention on than a review of a scope that at the time was basically discontinued and that I knew wasn't going to get great reviews anyway. But why did I even bother putting it together then? Well, that's a good point. I've already referenced the T6XIs a couple of times, and that is because I've already gotten my hands on a T6XI 3 18 by 56 So I figured before I go forward with that, let me get the predecessor video out of the way, so this way I have something to directly compare it to to see if the T6XI is a better scope than the T5s. Well, that is a topic for the T6 video. For right now, let's finish with this T5 real quick before it becomes a 45 minute long video. The T5s are all but discontinued, but they do pop up regularly for sale in the used market, whether it's on forums, Reddit, or on eBay, or Gunbroker for that matter. And you might find one of them for a fairly decent price, you might think, about $1,000 for this example, which is typically what they go for, and you might question if it's worth it. Truthfully, only you can answer that question, but from my testing of it, I can say that it's very solid. It does much, much better than the 5 to 25 did. As you could see, it's performed basically every role that it was intended to do very, very well, with the exception of the illumination, which is very lacking. The SCR reticle is basically the only reticle you can get in this magnification range, and it was a little disappointing, but not the end of the world. I do believe that with the T6XI 2.5 to 15, that the SCR is going to be useless up until about 4 or 5X. 2.5X to 3X doesn't sound like a big difference, but when you're looking at a very fine reticle to begin with, it only gets that much finer. As far as the overall physicality of this thing, the controls are pretty good to good. They are better than the 5 to 25. The Parallax doesn't have that weird rubber bandy feel. The illumination is basically the exact same illumination that we've found on this. It's the same on the T6, so there's no differences there. And all the other controls are basically the same, with the exception of the turrets. The turrets here, they do exude a bit of mush, but a very solid sounding click, but not the most satisfying feeling click. 
they do also require a good bit of effort to turn the turrets and it just isn't the best experience but far from the worst for the thousand dollar price point i think they're adequate but things like the athlon helos btr gen 2 has a much more satisfying feel and sound despite the fact that they're made in china and cost significantly less than this and they do feature locking turrets which is very nice but the biggest question I had at the beginning of this video is the optical performance of this 3 to 15 and I am delighted to say that it is vastly superior to the 5 to 25 and in general by its self performance it performs extremely well against some comparisons like I already made it still holds its own for the most part why would you buy this as opposed to a more modern rifle scope well maybe you're looking for something that's made in the US that doesn't cost attacker or mark 5 hd prices and this is going to be basically half the price of both of those which is going to make it very very compelling but you also have the t6 to consider but it's still going to cost you significantly more money than one of these is used i think if you're in the market for a t5 i did not review the one to five but i'd have to say it's going to be pretty solid but i'd probably still go with the p4 just because i i, I have such an amazingly good track record with that thing but this 3 to 15 versus the 5 to 25, go with this hands down. Don't even bother with the 5 to 25 unless you really, really want it. But I would suggest steering clear. So despite the fact I had this thing for about two years and I enjoyed the ever-loving crap out of it, I ended up selling it. The only real reason was, number one, I didn't have anything to really put it on. But number two, the locking turret thing. I really like having locking turrets. And seeing that the T6 came out with locking turrets is just proof positive that many of you out there like locking turrets as well. But that was really the only reason why I sold it. If it had locking turrets, I absolutely would have kept it. And it would be on my Tika CTR because I think that would be a beautiful match made in heaven. A very usable magnification range on a very usable and practical well-made scope on a very capable rifle. Anywho, that is going to be all for this review. Thank you all very much for watching. Hopefully you found this video informative, and if you did, please let me know in the comment section below. As always, thank you very much for watching. See you again next time. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand. But you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below, and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again. Thank you very much.